Hi, this is Craig Stocks here for Utah Desert Remote Observatories. You can find us online at www.utahdesertremote.com. And what I want to talk about today is the target that I imaged last night, and that was the uh, Wizard Nebula. And I want to talk through all the way from capture through PixInsight and Photoshop using my, my current post-processing uh, workflow which has changed somewhat since the last video that I did. And I, I want to try to give this as a complete overview, but also I want to try to make it a little bit more applicable for people who are new to PixInsight. And I'm certainly not an expert. I've only been using PixInsight for a few months. But when I first started and I started looking for uh, beginner tutorials, I found quite a few be that said they were beginner tutorials. And then as soon as the tutorial started, they said, you know, this is for beginners. Now we assume you already have installed the software and run through the integration and calibration and, and you have your images ready to process. And I was really looking, really looking for the integration calibration, you know, the, the beginning thing. So I want to talk through the whole process as I go through here, but generally one of the first things you might do when you get ready to image a new target and the wizard nebula is, is new for me is just do a quick Google image search and get some ideas of what you're looking at. And you know, I see uh, quite a few that look like in the um, Hubble SHO color palette. So that's probably the direction I'll head first. Uh, and I have not, I've looked at the data just enough to know that it's fairly good chance I'll be able to get something out of it. Other than that, uh, you're gonna see it as I see it. Um, so there may be some stumbles and uh, blind alleys. Uh, We'll just see how it goes. Also, I kind of anticipate this video will be a little on the long side, so I think I'll probably break it up into two videos. One focused on the PixInsight processes, and then a second one on Photoshop. So the images were captured last night from the remote observatory uh, here in the southwest corner of Utah. And this is the observatory, and this is the telescope that I used. It's a 12 and a half, half inch plane wave. Uh, CDK 12.5 with an ASI 6200 monochrome camera and a filter wheel attached. And the way that works with a remote telescope is there's a computer on the remote telescope and it's connected to the internet uh, as is my home computer. So you communicate with the remote PC uh, using something like Google Remote Desktop. There's a variety of different programs you can use. I've had real good luck with Google Remote Desktop. Uh, it seems to be pretty reliable and robust, and it's free. And the way I get the files transferred back and forth is through uh, Dropbox. So I have a shared Dropbox folder that lives on both my remote PC and the home PC. So as I'm imaging, the remote PC is what's controlling the telescope. The files get saved to this Dropbox folder which immediately transfers them over the internet to the Dropbox folder on my home PC. So when I get up in the morning, I have a, uh, a drive with the, all of the files taken last night that have been just kind of gradually uploaded during the night. In terms of software, uh, the remote PC is where all of the, the imaging software resides. So I'm using Voyager as kind of the top level uh, session controller. Uh, that's what controls the mount and the camera and the, uh, the sequence is set in it. It uses the SkyX, uh, which comes from software BISC, which makes the Paramount uh, mounts. And the SkyX is what actually is controlling the, the telescope mount, uh, but Voyager is telling it what to do. Voyager is also telling uh, PWI3, this is the plane wave interface, that manages the rotator and the focuser. So the rotator will rotate the camera to get the correct uh, angle of view. And then the uh, focuser obviously focuses the camera. Uh, currently I'm using PHD2 for guiding. I've kind of gone back and forth between PHD2 and the SkyX also is pretty robust for guiding. And then I also have a uh, Pegasus power box that controls a lot of the 12 volt uh, devices. And so I have the remote power box software also on the remote PC. On my home PC, which is where we'll be doing all of the image processing, 
I obviously have PixInsight because PixInsight is what does the, the basic calibration and integration, or as you might call it, stacking of the images. Uh, I've been kind of dabbling with IMPPG, which is it's a bit of a one-trick pony, but basically it has uh, a good deconvolution sharpening process built in that's very easy to use, uh, and it's free. Uh, so you'll see how I work that into the workflow. And then I use Photoshop to bring everything together, and that's where I do the final editing and color mapping and so forth. Uh, to me, it's kind of purpose-built for uh, editing images where PixInsight uh, feels, to me, it feels a little bit more like it was grafted on. It does a real good job with the integration. It, it feels awkward and more numerically driven for uh, image processing where Photoshop is more visually driven. And then I also use Lightroom as kind of a final step of editing, cropping, uh, and fine tuning images there eventually. So the capture process, as I said, was set up in Voyager. And this is what that Voyager sequence screen looks like. Uh, you can see the target is the wizard. And you can see the uh, coordinates as far as the right ascension, declination, and the uh, position angle of the camera. And I was set up with three filters, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And each one was doing 600 second exposures at a gain of 100 and an offset of 50. And I did three frames of each and then went to the next one, did three frames, went to the next one, did three frames. And then I repeated that through the night. Uh, I had it set to repeat five times. I don't think it got all five in because it was also programmed to basically start at uh, astronomical dark and then to stop with astronomical twilight or astronomical daylight when the uh, sun first started brightening the sky. So this is the, the script or the sequence that was run all night. And if we look at the conditions last night on the weather tab of the uh, Utah Desert Remote website, uh, we can see that even though there were some clouds yesterday during the particular in the afternoon, it mostly cleared up and then it was actually clear all night until early this morning and as the sun started coming up some clouds started building in and we we do have a cold front moving in so i'm probably going to be under clouds for the next couple nights from the cold front humidity got up to around 60 percent uh, i don't know if the dew heaters turned on or not they probably did uh, if we look at the wind, there were some gusts last night in the uh, you know 10 to 15 mile an hour range, so it's possible the wind uh, jiggled the telescope, so we may have lost a few subs. This is just the uh, humidity again, and this little spike here shows us that midday yesterday there was a little bit of sprinkles. If we look at the sky quality, and this is just scrolling down on that same uh, weather page, the seeing measurement, uh, we can see that for the night we averaged 2.23 uh, arc seconds seeing, which is fairly decent. Uh, the blue line shows the number of samples taken. The white line shows the resulting calculated seeing. And we see there is looks like a little cloud that rolled over around 10 o'clock and then maybe another little one a little bit after 11. And then after that, it was clear all night. But if we look at the sky quality, which is the darkness of the sky, we can see it started out pretty dark. Uh, and this is in uh, magnitudes per arc second squared. But this yellow line is showing the moon. And the moon came up shortly after sunset and got pretty high in the sky. So I was shooting with quite a bit of moonlight last night. So the next step is to go into PixInsight. And so let's switch to PixInsight. And if you're new to PixInsight, uh, it can be seem pretty daunting and overwhelming. Uh, I've got this blank screen. Uh, you may see the monitor up here in the left-hand corner showing the commands as they're being executed. Over on the right, I have some saved process icons for channel combination, dynamic background extraction, uh, arc sign H, uh, image stretch, the screen transfer function, uh, which is a kind of an automatic stretch and really does a very good job. 
histogram transformation, noise exterminator, and star exterminator, both from uh, Russell Croman. And those are fantastic plugins. They are an additional cost. Uh, you know, so they're something that I've added to PixInsight, but I use those on basically every image. Sometimes I still use StarNet to remove stars, but I generally find Star Exterminator is faster and for me does a cleaner job. And then I have curves and uh, I sometimes use cosmetic correction. Uh, normally I don't, but uh, I have that process icon saved. And you can save a process icon for tasks that you run a lot. Uh, when you open that task, for instance, if you go to process, uh, and we'll just pick one here. Uh, let's say channel match. And because I have two monitors, a lot of the windows will open on the second monitor. You'll see me drag it over. If I want to save this, I can click on this to create a new instance of this, and that creates a process icon. I can then rename it to, can't have any spaces, test process, let's call it. And then I can save it somewhere on my screen. And then when I, I can close this now, and this little process icon still remains, so it becomes a shortcut to get to that uh, process. If I had made any settings in here, they would be saved with that process icon. And the way I get these back in is by saving a project. So you go over here and save project, and I have saved one called just blank project with process icons. So when I open PixInsight, I can load this project and that will load up all of these icons for me. The first thing I always do with the images is go through them and kick out the bad ones. Um, and that's a lesson I guess I've learned the hard way is including bad data, even though it's more, uh, more bad data doesn't make a better picture. You really need to get rid of the bad ones and use just the good ones. You're, you're better off with fewer good frames than more mediocre frames. And the tool that I like to use for that is the blink tool. And I say there's, there are probably better ways to do everything I do in here, but this is how I've been doing it. So if you go to image inspection under processes and blink, and that will give you this dialog box. And what we need to do is open some files to look at. So I click on the open folder and I navigate to the wizard folder and Voyager will save them. I have it configured to save them in, in date folders within the target. So here's the images from last night. And there are all of my subs, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. So just click on one, control A to select all of them, click open, and PixInsight will open a preview of each one of these and apply the uh, the screen transfer function or its automatic stretch function so that we can see what's going on. Now, there's two icons over here. The one I normally use is the top one. And what that will do is make a second pass through all these and it will apply a unique stretch to each one based on its characteristics. If you don't do that, I believe the default is that it determines the stretch parameters for the first frame and then applies that to all of them. So they all get the same stretch. What we want to do now is step through these one by one and pick out the good and the bad. And so I'll start by zooming in and I almost always lose the first few frames as the telescope is still settling down. Uh, not always, but usually. So we'll, what we're looking for is primarily these uh, egg-shaped or elongated stars. And this first one is, is one that we need to kick out. To do that, what I've been doing is go to the, uh, this middle icon, which is Move Selected Files to a New Location. So I'll click on that, and I'll go to my folder that has the wizard. I'm just going to create a new folder here and I'm going to name it rejects. And then so 
since I'll be using this again, I'm going to move it so this select button is fairly close to the, to the move icon. Click select folder. And what I did is I just moved this file from the uh, 911 folder that it was in to the rejects folder. Move down to the next one. Ah, that one looks good. Look at the next one. Yeah, that one's stars are a little bigger, a little elongated. Um, I think I'll go ahead and kick that one out since we've already selected the folder. All I have to do now is click the transfer and then select folder and then continue stepping through. Um, this one again has a little bit of, looks like a little wind jiggle. So move, select folder. And I just kind of quickly step through these, looking for any ones where the, either the, there was movement. Uh, this one looks like we had some clouds move in, but the stars are still fairly tight. Uh, I think I'll leave that one in for now. That one looks better. That one looks good. That looks good. That looks good. So now we're moving into the oxygen and right off the bat, the first one has some jiggle in it. So we'll get rid of that. And what this process does is leave just the good frames in the main folder. And then I can just load all of those into the uh, integration step using uh, the WBPP tool, which is the weighted batch preprocessor script. And if you're new to PixInsight, there's two things you need to keep in mind. The first one is this blank process to get rid of the bad frames. And the second one is WBPP. That is the uh, kind of the overall tool that coordinates calibration and integration. And once you, you know, once you go through it a couple times, it's pretty easy to use. So, so far the sulfurs are all looking, oh, there's a bad one. Kick that one out. Just a couple more to look at here. Uh, this is probably less tedious than it sounds, uh, because in reality I've been talking and explaining what I'm doing, oops, wrong button, uh, and going through at the same time. So. There's a sulfur, there's an oxygen, and there's a hydrogen. So we've got these all sorted out now. We've moved the bad ones to their own folder. So I can close this. The next step is the calibration and integration. And to do that, I'm gonna to go to script, batch processing, weighted batch preprocessor. And that will open the WBPP dialog, which is a, a big dialog with tabs and lots of options, and it can seem overwhelming. For the most part, the defaults seem to do a pretty decent job. The first thing I want to do is just a reset uh, to, you know, what I was using before, but clear all the files. Click OK. So now the tabs across the top show me what I have for the light frames, flats, darks, and bias. So what we want to do, for instance, and I usually start with the lights, is load all of our lights in here. And we load files from the bottom where it says plus files. Now there's some other ways you can do this. You can add a whole directory at a time. Uh, I'm going to do it the, the more tedious way, adding a, files at a time. So add files. And since we had last opened the uh, wizard in this folder. That's what comes up by, by default as the, uh, the folder to view. Click the first one, control A, click open. And you can see there's our list of files. They're organized by filter, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and by exposure time. And they're all 600 seconds or 10 minutes. About the only things to look at for subframe weighting, I basically always use PSF signal weight. And for image integration, I usually either use auto or I will sometimes specify a Windsorized Sigma clipping. But for the most part, I've just been keeping this on auto. So now we need to load flats. I will move to the flats tab, click files, and I need to go to my folder that has my flats in it. And I've got flats per filter. 
and I'm just going to start with, I'll just load all, all these from hydrogen on, and that loaded more than I need, so I'll click on luminance and red and remove selected. And that will leave me with just the three I need, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. Darks, we have 600 second exposure, so we need to have 600 second darks. Again, I'll click on files. I'll go to my folder that has my calibration data for the monochrome camera. Here are my darks. And we'll scroll down to the bottom. Uh, 600 second darks. There are those. And lastly, we need to load our bias frames. Again, we go to Files, My Bias, and click Open. So we now have Bias, Darks, Flats, Lights. If I look at the Calibration tab, there's a couple things to check here. Uh, if I click on one of the groups of light frames, uh, I normally set an output pedestal of 100. And after you enter that in, click Apply to All Light Frames. And so now each one of these is going to use a pedestal of 100 as kind of a, a base. These aren't uh, CFA or uh, color filter array images, so I don't need to do anything with that. I don't want to save the uh, rejection maps and drizzle weight, so I can uncheck that. And the last thing I need to do is set the registration. Now, I haven't run the Wizard Nebula before, so I'm just going to set it on Auto and PixInsight as it does the uh, stacking will pick the best frame to use as a reference frame. And then the last thing I need to do is set an output directory. I have a folder called uh, PI Swap Files, and I'll just create a new folder here, and we'll name it wizard and select folder. So just that easy now I have the uh, WBPP script configured and ready to run. I can click on diagnostics just to make sure that it doesn't see any problems. It says it's going to use 19 gigabytes and we have 440 available on my D drive so so that's good. So at this point I'm ready to click run and it will give me that same message again. Click continue and it now opens this execution monitor so that we can watch it as it runs. Uh, this is probably going to take about 20 minutes to run, uh, so I'm going to pause the video here, and when it's done, I'll come back and we'll pick up on uh, the rest of the processes in PixInsight. Okay, I'm back, and you can see now that the process has finished, and it took about 18 minutes, and it the process monitor shows us the steps that it took and how long each one took to execute. And so now we're done with this, we can just click done. And done again. And it comes back to the uh, script. We can close this now. And incidentally, when you exit this, since this is checked to save groups on exit, when I close this, it actually saves the uh, all these settings. So if I reopen the uh, script, it will come back with all those settings still intact. So to open the files that we just created, I can double click here in the uh, center of the panel and it will bring up a, the open dialog box. And let's go to swap files, wizard. And it created these four folders based on our settings. If you have a, a color camera, you may have a debayered folder. Uh, if I had done the cosmetic correction, there would be a cosmetic corrections folder and so forth. The one we're interested in is master. Uh, secondarily, one that we might be interested in is the logs, because this is where the log file resides. So let's double click on master, and we can see there's a lot of files here. The ones that we're looking for are labeled master light. And if I, what I normally would have is for this to be sorted in descending date modified sequence. That way the newest full files are right at the top. There's the three, sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen. Uh, if I add data tomorrow night or sometime in the future, 
Uh, I'll get new versions of these with a uh, one or a two or three suffix. And that just puts the, the newest ones on top for me. So I'll click open. And these are all linear images. And I'm sure you've heard that term, a linear image versus nonlinear or linear data versus nonlinear data. Uh, from a photographic perspective, what does that mean? Well, let me jump back over to my presentation material. Linear data is kind of what the name implies. It's, um, it, it's formed along a straight line. If we make a graph of a, you have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and if we draw a straight line, and let's say this straight line is representing the, the raw value that's captured in the raw file, which would go from zero to, uh, if it's a 16-bit camera, 65,535. Those are all the possible values in our raw file for each pixel. And those correspond to the number of photons detected, or actually they correspond to an electrical charge, which is proportional to the number of photons detected. But we can draw this graph that says the number of photons detected is directly related to the raw pile, the, the value that winds up for that pixel. So if we detect 100 photons, that will correspond to some particular value in the uh, raw data. I don't know what that number is. You could find it with a little research. Uh, it's not important for me to know, but if you're actually doing scientific research, that's an important value to know because this raw linear data is the only time you have that correlation so that you can calculate how many photons are related to that value. But let's simplify this. Instead of working in 16-bit, 65, 535, let's work in 8-bit. So zero to 255 just to to make the math simple and let's say that 100 photons detected corresponds to a full value of 255 so if we detect more than 100 photons we're still just going to have 255 because this actually just flattens out here no matter no matter how many photons we detect we're always going to read 255 for 100 or more if we detect 50 photons halfway up the Y scale, then the raw value reading would be 127. And in photographic terms, if you think in terms of stops or an F number, uh, an F number change or one stop change is twice the amount of light or half the amount of light. So as a photographer, you might think of that as one stop. So our first one stop of information is consumed in the first half or the top half of all of the data values in that raw file. So if we are capturing 12 stops of information, the first stop is here. The second stop is going to be from 50 to 25 in raw values of 64 to 127. The third stop would be down here, then the fourth, fifth, sixth. You can see they just get progressively smaller and smaller. And as astro imagers, we're taking pictures of generally pretty dark stuff. So all of our data is going to be down here in the not very many photons detected, therefore very low values along this raw value axis. And with linear data, that means our image is going to look very dark because the majority of the information we collected is all down here in the very dark values. That's difficult to work with visually because if you think in terms of a histogram, all the data we collected is all kind of stuff down here on the left hand side of the histogram. What we want to do is stretch this histogram out, hence stretched data so that we can see more of the bright values. And that's done by applying a curve. So instead of translating from picks photons to raw value in a linear fashion, we apply a curve. And along that curve, then that basically stretches the histogram out. So these low values are represented in higher values in the readout. That's basically what's happening with stretch data versus linear data, that we're literally 
stretching the information out in a nonlinear fashion so that we give more variability to these low numbers. And if you look at the graph, zero is still zero, but one now is going to be way over here. So we've added the opportunity for a lot more divisions to represent from zero to one, one to two, two to three, and so forth. Uh, and we have in turn somewhat compressed the stuff at the brighter end that we don't really care about that much, but the stuff at the bright end could get uh, blown out because a lot of your brighter values all get consolidated up here in the steep part of the curve. So with that, let's go back to PixInsight. As I mentioned, these are linear files. One of the most confusing things, and I'm just going to grab the hydrogen because it's probably the most interesting, is linear data, we see it's very dark. And one of the confusing things, but very helpful things that PixInsight has is the screen transfer function, which is really just applying an automatic stretch so that you can see what you're working with. The data is still in a linear format, but it lets us see what we're doing. And the little radioactive button in here will activate the STF auto stretch. And so this is what it looks like stretched. And uh, like magic, it just looks better, right? But you do need to keep track of the fact that we're looking at a stretched, an auto stretched linear file as opposed to data that's actually been stretched. And one way that you know that this is a linear file is see this green bar next to the file name? That tells us that we're looking at a stretched version. If I turn off the stretch, you'll see the green bar goes away. So let's turn it back on just to see what we're working with. It looks pretty decent. Uh, looks like we have nice tight stars, uh, nice sharp diffraction spikes, uh, lots of good detail. Uh, it's, I feel like it's a little bit too bright in the background. It, it, I would normally like this to be a little bit darker, but that's a pretty decent starting point. So what I might want to do with this, uh, we need to do a couple things. Uh, we need to stretch the data and then we'll want to remove the stars and we'll probably do a noise reduction along the way. Although if we look at this, it's got some noise, but not a terrible amount. So I would typically start with hydrogen. And the first thing I, we need to do is stretch this. And I'm going to use the STF function. You'll see that this is one of the, the icons I have over here. It looks like it's pretty uniform, although this may be darker. There may be a little bit of a gradient, and we did have a full moon last night. A good tool for getting rid of gradients is the DBE, or Dynamic Background Extraction tool. And one of the techniques, and I have this configured and saved as a process icon, one of the techniques that you'll see online is to create this array of sample points around the perimeter. And because I'm always using the same resolution camera, I can create these once and then save that configuration. And they also recommend uh, the tolerance and uh, shadows, relaxation and smoothing factors. Uh, this is referred to as a fairly relaxed uh, DBE settings. I can't tell you much about it other than it seems to work some of the time and sometimes it gives me some fairly nasty halos, but it's worth trying. So because I have these saved, I can go. Oh, and the other thing that you might change is the target correction, uh, division versus subtraction. And sometimes I do both. Sometimes I just do one or the other. If I do an execute, now it will change this underlying image. So now it's no longer that pure linear data. And so we'll need to update our screen transfer and you can see it changed just a little bit. It's, I think maybe it's a little bit smoother. So I'm going to call that good. And since I did a dynamic background extraction on this one, I'll do that on the others as well. And I like the way this is stretching it for the most part. So I'm going to go ahead and use the STF function which I just opened from my saved icons. I'll click on the little radioactive button again, and that applies this screen transfer. 
but I want to modify this a little bit. I want to make the background darker. And the way I'm going to do that is click on the plus sign, and then I can click repeatedly here on the top, and you can see it's starting to open up the blacks and the midpoint sliders. And once I zoom in enough that those are well separated, I can come back to my arrow tool. And if I grab the left slider and move it back and forth, you can see that's darkening the background and I can darken it a little bit. And I can also brighten the lights a little bit. And I don't want to get too carried away with this, but I want to, if I can get a little bit more contrast out of it at the, when it's still in the raw format, that I, I feel like that helps me later. I think that looks a little bit better. So we can't just apply this, unfortunately. There's some, some tricks that you have to use in PixInsight. And the trick is that we have to open up the histogram transformation tool. This triangle represents the uh, process and its settings. We can drag the settings down to this lower bar on the histogram transformation tool and then let go. And you can see this is the curve that it's going to apply to stretch this data. If I click the uh, solid square now, it will apply that to the image. And what happened? It just turned white. Well, what happened is we still have our screen stretch turned on. So when I turn off, so we're stretching it twice. And you can see the green bar is still over here. If I turn that off, now we are looking at a stretched file. And you can see the green bar has gone away. So let's look at the oxygen next. I'll pull it down here. And again, this is a, a linear file. We know we want to, let's just go ahead and turn on our screen transfer function to see what we're looking at. I'll run the DBE on it. Since we, since I did on the first one, I feel like to be consistent, I should on all three. Click the radioactive button again to see what it looks like. And then we'll adjust the darks and the white point to get a little bit more contrast. Drag the settings down to the histogram transformation tool. Click to apply. Turn off the screen transfer. And then last, we'll look at the sulfur. We'll do the same thing again. Let's take a peek at it. I'll go to the DBE. Execute that which removes that gradient. Click the radioactive button again. Darken the darks. Lighten the lights a little bit. Drag the settings down to the histogram transformation tool. Click to apply. And then turn off the uh, screen transfer function. And we're done with the screen transfer function now. The next thing I want to do is a noise reduction, and I'll apply that to each one of these images. This is Noise Exterminator by Russell Croman, and again, I have that as a saved process icon. I can just drag this process icon onto the image, and it will execute the noise reduction on that frame. Uh, first one, I think, has to load up some of the uh, files and resources, and then the second and third will run faster. But it's amazingly fast. Uh, Russell's just done a great job putting this together, and this noise reduction uh, is, is just like magic, the way it reduces noise without uh, affecting stars or nebula. I'll do the same thing to oxygen file. And then I'll do the same thing for the hydrogen. And let's just zoom in a little bit. We can see the, the noise there. Drag noise exterminator over. And look at the difference it makes. I don't know how well this will come across on YouTube, but it really does a great job. So the next thing, and kind of we're getting towards the end here in PixInsight, uh, I want to remove the stars, but before I do, uh, normally I would come back and use RGB stars, but I didn't shoot any RGB data. So what I'll do here is just look at the 
the three and pick out the one that looks like it has the nicest stars that are nice, tight, sharp. And I kind of, I think I like the hydrogen the best. So I'm going to save these stars when I re remove the stars. And the way I'm going to do that is I have star exterminator saved over here as a process icon. This time I'm going to double click on it to open the dialog box and I'm going to click the box that says generate star image. So that will remove the stars from this frame and create a new one that has just the stars in it. So we can execute that. You can either click the, the square or in this case I'm just going to grab the triangle, drag it onto the image, and it will run star exterminator. When I first started dabbling in uh, a starless workflow I was using StarNet as a standalone program which means it, it wasn't able to use the uh, graphics processing unit or GPU built into my computer. And each one of these files would take about an hour to run. So I would start it running and then go eat breakfast and then come back and start the next one running and go do something else. Uh, with Star Exterminator in PixInsight using the uh, GPU each file takes about 15 seconds. Uh, I think this new version might be a little bit slower. It might be more like 20 seconds, but it, it's just amazing uh, what this modern technology can do. So there's our star image now with the stars extracted, and there is the image without any stars. And one of the things to look at is if there's any residual stars, that are left in this image, that means they didn't get extracted. But this came out real nice and clean. Now, like I said, I haven't run this data before, so I'm seeing it just as you're seeing it. So let's just park this one aside. Let's pull up the next file. We don't need the uh, generate star image anymore, so I'll uncheck that. And we'll execute this on the, I think this is the sulfur image. So it's running now. You can watch in the uh, process monitor. You can see the, the percentages as they count up towards 100% done. And you know, big shout out to, to Russell Croman for the work he's done here. Uh, it, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, he had to create a lot of very uh, carefully prepared starless images using other editing techniques in order to train his uh, is artificial intelligence program. So there's our sulfur mono image. And the last one that we have is oxygen. We'll do the same thing. Run star exterminator on it. Now when this gets done, I'm going to do a couple other moves here in uh, PixInsight. Uh, for one, I'm going to combine these into an SHO starless image uh, that we're going to use as a luminance layer and we'll go sharpen that separately and then we'll save each one of these as a 16-bit TIFF and you know some people have pushed back saying well, gosh 16-bit you're losing data and my feeling on that is because this has already been stretched so it's nonlinear data uh, at this point 16-bit is is good enough and this one you can see did leave a little bit of a smudge down here from that star that that may or may not need to be removed in Photoshop. So we're done with this. I can close this, but you'll see the process icon is still over here. So just for fun, let's combine these into a color image. And to do that, I'm going to use the channel combination. And this is real simple to use. It just gives you three drop downs where you can choose what to use for the red channel, what to use for green, and what to use for blue. So for red, if we're going to create an SHO image, we would want to use sulfur. Click OK. For green, we're going to use hydrogen. Click OK. And then for blue, we're going to use oxygen. Click OK. And so there's our sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen, or SHO, the, the classic Hubble palette. I'll click the uh, the apply global button and that will create a new image that has the uh, color combination of those three channels. Pretty green looking uh, which is common and since we put hydrogen in the green channel and if you remember the uh, hydrogen was by far the brightest of the uh, 
of the three that we looked at here. If I can find it, there it is. So, you know, that's why it tends to look very green is because of the uh, predominance of green. We can try a little SCNR on this to knock out some of that green, which you would find under process. Go to all processes, SCNR. And this is a single channel noise reduction that we can choose what color to remove and how much. And let's back this down to something like 30% and click the apply. And so that took some of the green out. We don't want to take it all out. Uh, we do want to keep it visible. Let's see what happens if we take a little bit more out. And I'm going to quit there. So that's that's not a, a bad starting point. What I want to do now is convert this to grayscale and save this as a luminance file that we will use to sharpen. So I'm going to go to Image, Color Spaces, Convert to Grayscale. And I will save this as a 16-bit TIFF also, and we'll take that into IMPPG to run through deconvolution sharpening. So now all that's left is to save each one of these images. So I'll go to File, Save As, and I want to save this in the same folder as my data. So it's going to be saved as a TIFF, and I'm just going to call this SHO for luminance. And I'll save this as a 16-bit TIFF. Click OK. And then I'll just iconize that, turn it into an icon, move it out of the way. Grab the next one. File, Save As. Go to my folder with the data. Choose to save this as a TIFF file. Click Save. 16-bit. OK. Move this out of the way. Grab the next one. Save as. Go to the folder with my data. Select TIFF. Select 16-bit. I'll minimize that. Oxygen. File. Save as. Navigate to the folder, select TIFF as the file type, click Save, 16-bit, OK, and lastly, the stars. So, File, Save As. Uh, since the last folder I accessed was the, uh, the wizard folder, in this case it comes back to that one. Uh, it's already set for TIFF. And it tells me that this was the stars from the hydrogen file. So I can just use that name. That's unique. 16-bit. OK. And at this point, we're pretty well done with what we need to do in PixInsight. I'll pick this up in the next video, and we'll look at the uh, sharpening in IMPPG and how we use Photoshop then to bring this all together into a finished image. I'll see you in the next video.